Hello, this is Just Another 80s Geek, and you are tuned in to The Geek Showcase, where we highlight all things geeky. Today, we are giving you our next in the series of the ultimate Saturday morning cartoon lineup, and this time we're focused on 1985. So if you've missed the previous episodes, please go back, check out my videos for 1983 and 1984. This is the third in that series. We'll be making our way all the way to 1989. The 1983 episode will give you the rules, but basically we're looking at cartoons that aired in 1985, and they just had to follow some simple rules that couldn't have aired before 1980s. They had to air new episodes in 1985, and I have I cannot use them twice, so they can't appear in two different year lists. And like I've been saying in the other videos, each year, each time slot of each year has a theme, and we will give you a time slot for eight o'clock all the way through the noon hour. So we feature eight, ep- eight cartoons each year. So one last thing before we get started, let's take a quick look at the 1983 slate, which featured the Superbook slash Flying House, Smurfs, Inspector Gadget, Saturday Supercade, Dungeons and Dragons, Strawberry Shortcake, G.I. Joe, and He-Man, and the Masters of the Universe. Now in the 1884 episode, we featured the Get Along Gang, Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats, Alvin and the Chipmunks, Muppet Babies, Kid Video, Rainbow Bright, The Challenge of the Gobots, and Transformers. So that brings us to 1985 today. So without further ado, let's look at what made it at the 8 o'clock time slot. In the 8 o'clock time slot, we have none other than the Raccoons. The Raccoons, which is a Canadian series that aired from 1985 to 1989. There was 47 episodes that aired in the 80s. It kept going past that, so it aired 60 episodes total on into the early 90s. This Canadian series actually aired in the U.S. on the Disney Channel, so one of the early shows that got featured on the Disney Channel. It wasn't a Disney Channel cartoon, but it appeared on that channel. There actually were four specials that aired with the raccoon three of them were television specials and one was a direct to video special that these all came out prior to the series so that was the raccoons in the lost star the raccoons on ice the christmas raccoons things of that nature and then we got the actual raccoons series and it featured a, a bunch of raccoons obviously bert uh ralph melissa and a bunch of other ones and over time and they basically were living in this town and they found themselves kind of up against a greedy industrialist millionaire that was Cyril Sneer, all right? And Cyril Sneer had a son, Cedric, who was the same age as Bert and Melissa, etc. So it was kind of like this series that was basically about saving nature from greedy industrialists and things of that nature. And it started as just a 13-episode idea. So it was only supposed to be 13 episodes Obviously, as I said before, it ended up going 60 total because of the success. It won a Gemini Award for Best Animated Series and uh, was nominated for some other awards, etc. So this series, a Canadian series that aired in the U.S. and was kind of an introduction to a lot of uh, U.S. audiences to some Canadian voice actors that would go on and be very popular throughout the 80s. So this show featured the likes of Len Carlson. Len Carlson would be most known by 80s animation fans as the voice of Big Boss from Cops. He also did Mason Sundown from that series, but Big Boss was kind of the big one. And he also appeared in a variety of other... uh, He was Ganon in Captain N and the Swamp Thing in the the early 90s. So a very prolific Canadian voice actor that uh, some people would know. And it also featured Bob Dermer. Bob Dermer is a good one for me because not only do I remember Bob Dermer from his voicing Ralph Raccoon in The Raccoons, but he also did Cloud Keeper in one of the Care Bear movies, but most, more notably in the Care Bear franchise, he did Grumpy Bear in a variety of different specials, movies, and TV shows. I think he appeared as Grumpy Bear in at least six or seven different things. And the little-known live-action slash puppet slash animated show Today's Special, which aired and started airing in the early 80s, 
Bob Dermer was actually the voice of Sam Crenshaw. So for those of you that remember that, I give you extra geek points because Sam Crenshaw was fantastic. I still remember him singing his song about the car that he was giving up, Gertrude. And it was just such a sad song to me when I was a child. But go back and, and watch today's special. Bob Dermer does Bob Crenshaw, uh, or Sam Crenshaw, excuse me, in that show. So the Raccoons also featured very early the first work. I think this is the very debut of Tara Strong. Tara Strong did a, a guest voice on the Raccoons. Obviously, she would later be known for so many things, from Twilight Sparkle to Raven to Harley Quinn, one of the most prolific voice actresses of all time. Um, also, the Raccoons featured Susan Roman, and Susan Roman might be known by more people as Sailor Jupiter from the Sailor Moon series, but Susan Roman also did quite a few voices on the Raccoons, including Melissa Raccoon, which is one of the main characters. So... The Raccoons was just a, a classic 80s show. I remember having the a Christmas ornament that had the Raccoons logo on it and everything. And, as it is with most things in the 80s, there is possibility that there's a reboot on its way. There's rumors out there online that there is a reboot, reboot called When Raccoons Fly. So stay on the lookout for that if you're a Raccoons fan. And uh, that is what gets our 8 o'clock time slot. So let's take a look at what gets 8.30. Oh, and before we get too far ahead of ourselves, just to give you the the time slots, 8 o'clock in 1983 was Superbook and Flying House, 84 it was Get Along Gang, and now in 85 it is The Raccoons. So I don't know if that gives you any hints on the theme for the 8 o'clock hour, but that is, that is what we had, Superbook, Flying House, Get Along Gang, and Raccoons. So what will join Smurfs and Heathcliff in the 8.30 time slot? In 1985, we're going to go to a show called The Littles. The Littles, if you remember that one. Not as well known, but it aired 29 episodes from 1983 into 1985. It was developed by a guy named Woody Kling, who also had something to do with the origination of and the creation of Rainbow Bright, which should be no surprise that Bettina Bush did a voice as Rainbow Bright and as Lucy Little in this series. So, two vehicles for Bettina Bush here. This is a Deke uh, series, as you've seen a lot of so far in the 80s, and it aired on ABC. It's actually based on a children's novel by John Peterson from 1967, and then Woody Kling kind of took that children's novel and developed it into a TV series. There was two movies. One was a made-for-TV movie, and it aired uh, kind of in the ABC Weekend Special episodes. It was broken into a bunch of parts and, and aired in the ABC Weekend Special, so kind of a crossover there. And it was one of Deke's first series, uh, along with Inspector Gadget and Heathcliff, but it was the first to air on a network, whereas Inspector Gadget and Heathcliff had aired in syndication. So it's Deke's first series to air on a regular cable network versus syndication. So that's kind of interesting. This featured, if you're not familiar, I mean, it says it in the title, but The Littles, all right? It's kind of like that whole fairy tale take on, you know, tiny little individuals that live in a regular world with big giant people, etc. So you had Henry Big, which was the main kid that in, that was involved in this series. And then you had Tom Little, Lucy Little, Dinky Little, Grandpa Little, all these different Littles, all right? Helen, Frank, Ashley, there's a bunch of them. And then obviously you had Henry Big and uh, was not alone. He had parents and, and other people that lived in the, the regular world. So that is kind of where you got your, not a ton of, known voices i mean frank welker did a, a little bit bj ward greg berger etc but um otherwise most of the names i would mention would not be known to you but the littles was just kind of a similar series to smurfs and snorks and, and things of that nature and i just thought it was an interesting show you know you had your books you had the movies you had the tv series so I think it does a good job of kind of capturing one of the trends in 80s cartoons, and it also fits the 8.30 time slot, which you'll have to kind of keep an eye out for what that is. So The Littles, a classic 1980s show, takes our 8.30 time slot here for 1985. Let's move on to the 9 o'clock time slot. Similar, yet different, we're going to go with a show called, not The Littles, but The Wuzzles. The Wuzzles. So The Wuzzles was a interesting series that came out of an idea pitched by Michael Eisner for his new, at the time new, Disney television animation studio. So this is a very early Disney series, 
It aired on CBS. It was a Saturday morning cartoon. It lasted for 13 episodes here in 1985. And the idea here is that the characters are hybrids of two different animals. So you had Bumble Lion, Ellaroo, Butterbear, Moosel, Hopopotamus, Rhinoki, Crocosaurus, Flizzard. Um, so you had all these kind of crazy characters that were combinations of two animals. Uh, and it was just a fun little show. This and the Adventures of Gummy Bears actually premiered on the same day in the same t- uh, time slot. This one was on CBS and Gummy Bears was on NBC. So what Disney did is they basically these are their first two series and they aired them on the same time slot on two different channels to see how they went. And uh, I guess they really wanted to capture that time slot. Both series were successful. But Wuzzles ended up ending its production after its initial run because of the death of one of its voice actors. The voice of Moosel, Bill Scott, actually died. uh, And they just kind of stopped production on the Wuzzles. So obviously Gummy Bears is the one that more people know. Um, Little trivia fact here, Butter Bear and Rhino Key actually appear in an episode of DuckTales. So there's a crossover into another Disney series. And they also obviously had a partnership with Hasbro, so there was toys and things of that nature. It was originally entitled Jumble Isle, so it was going to be called Jumble Isle instead of Wuzzles because of the jumbling of the two animal characters, I suppose. But it ended up going with Wuzzles instead. And just to kind of touch, we mentioned that Bill Scott was one of the voice actors that did um, Moosel and that he passed away. It also has some other known voice actors that most people would recognize which would be the likes of Henry Gibson, who did Ella Rue, Brian Cummings, who did Bumble Lion, and probably most notable from the people that will be listening to this, Alan Oppenheimer, the voice of Skeletor, did Rhino Key, and he did the crocodile character, which I believe I had mentioned the name was Crocosaurus. So Crocosaurus and Rhino Key were done by Alan Oppenheimer. So, Wuzzles is a a very early Disney cartoon, and I think that warrants its spot here as Disney would become a major player in the 80s and 90s here in the cartoon world. So, Wuzzles, one of the originals, takes our 9 o'clock time slot, and if you're keeping track, that time slot was belonging to Inspector Gadget and Alvin and the Chipmunks in 1983-1984. I should throw out a note there, I didn't throw this out here before. But Inspector Gadget and Alvin Ch- and the Chipmunks are the only two shows that don't fit any, t- any type of theme. All right, So they're not part of the 9 o'clock theme. Inspector Gadget, Alvin and the Chipmunks, kind of one-offs. They didn't fit any other theme that I can come up with. So Wuzzles starts the theme here in 1985 for the 9 o'clock hour. Just keep that in mind. Let's move on to our 9.30 time slot. We had Saturday Super Kid and Muppet Babies in previous years. In 1985, though, we're going to go to... The classic Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. Yes, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling aired 26 episodes from 1985 to 1986. This was another CBS Saturday morning cartoon and another cartoon that was done by Deke. It's still owned by WWE and they still own the rights to this, so you never know what they're going to do with that down the line. The the interesting thing here was if you were a WWE fan or WWF at the time fan and you are watching WWF programming and matches and pay per views and it's you know all their TV shows, the cartoon does not keep up with what happens in the actual wrestling world. So in the wrestling world, you're probably if you're familiar with wrestling at all, people turn babyface, turn heel, they're good, they're bad, etc. And they had some changes like this, for example. Um, Roddy Piper, I believe, goes from face to heel during this time. But in the cartoon, he's going to stay heel. So the cartoon kind of sticks with what they are, even if they changed in real life. Um, Real life, quote unquote, WWF. Or it actually kept some characters, even though they left the company. So like Jimmy Snuka leaves the company, and he's still featured on the cartoon. So that's kind of interesting. But this is just a a cartoon that features a bunch of wrestlers in cartoon form. And there's good guys and there's bad guys, and they kind of go through their different stuff. Um, interesting, some voice work here that I think is interesting. Brad Garrett, I believe this is his debut as far as that goes, and he plays the voice of Hulk Hogan. We have Charlie Adler as Roddy Piper, Louis Arquette as Superfly Jimmy Snuka, James Avery, the dad from Fresh Prince, playing the voice of Junkyard Dog, George DeCenzo, the voice of Hordak from She-Ra, 
does Captain Lou Albano, Pat Fraley does Hillbilly Jim, Neil Ross does Mean Gene. So it's just some fun voice casting here with who's going to get to do the voices of these characters since the real wrestlers were too busy on the road and making all their dates that they couldn't voice the characters for their, you know, their own characters. So it only aired for 26 episodes, but that's enough for two seasons worth of Saturday mornings, basically, when you go through that. So Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling Wrestling was a huge thing in the 80s. WWF explodes, so I think it's good that we find a spot for Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling here in the 9.30 time slot. Let's see where we go with 10 o'clock. This might throw some people off because you would expect it maybe in a different time slot. But our 10 o'clock show is going to be Gem. Gem, the classic music-centric vehicle with the holograms and the misfits so gem aired for 65 episodes in the 80 tied with a lot of shows for 20th most because that's basically one syndicated run of 65 episodes it aired episodes from 1985 all the way through 1988 this is a hasbro slash sunbow slash marvel vehicle which is similar to gi joe and transformers it was a syndicated series created by christy marks it featured gem and the holograms you might remember the names of kimber uh, Aja and Shayna. I might be saying those wrong. It's been a long time since I watched Gem. I apologize. And they usually faced off against the Misfits, which featured Pizzazz, Roxy, Stormer, and Jetta. And then later on in the later episodes would feature the Stingers, which was Riot, Rapture, and Minx. And then there was the Starlight Girls. Those were 12 foster children. I'm not going to get into a lot of details. But Gem was very successful. It was the number one Nielsen-rated syndicated cartoon series in 1986 and 1987. Uh, it was the third most watched children's program in syndication with 2.5 million viewers weekly. Aired in a bunch of different countries. Was nominated for some Young Artist Awards for uh, Samantha Newark's performance and for Best Animated Series. And obviously, there was competition here between Barbie and Jem as far as the toys go because they're both dolls that are trying to be aimed at the female, you know, the young girl audience. So there was similar product lines from both Mattel and Hasbro for both Barbie and Jem. And it ended up where both were kind of competing against each other and it was affecting sales. Hasbro actually discontinued the Gem toy line at the end of 1987 um, because it just didn't quite meet expectations, but the series did continue on into 1988. And just some quick trivia here, the name was originally going to be M. So the show was originally going to be called just the letter M. I think it's a good thing that they changed to Gem. Gem and the Holograms, I think it goes much better off the tongue. And Christy Marks has said that she would love to do a reboot, but this is a complicated one because the rights with all the music and different stuff make it very difficult to pull that off. So we'll see if she ever, or someone else, is ever able to pull that off. So Gem is our 10 o'clock show. That means it's time for our 10.30 time slot, and this should be no surprise if you look at our previous years what the theme is, because in 1983 we had Strawberry Shortcake, 1984 we had Rainbow Bright, and now we are going to She-Ra, the Princess of Power. So She-Ra, the spinoff from He-Man, aired 93 episodes in the 80s from 1985 to 1987. That's the ninth most episodes of any cartoon in the decade. Obviously a filmation spinoff of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. The initial group of characters and the premise were created by some uncredited writers you might have heard from before, Larry Dottilio and J. Michael Straczynski. Um, and obviously, she we had the crossover movie, uh, Secret of the Sword, and we've had, had the Christmas special, and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, she and the Princess of Power, they've all gone on to have a long-lasting life in pop culture. There was a rebooted series in 2018 on Netflix called she and the Princesses of Power that received a lot of positive feedback and acclaim. Uh, on September 13th, Amazon of 2021, this is just a little bit, a couple years ago here, Amazon announced that a live action she series was in development with DreamWorks Animation serving as an executive producer of the series uh, and be a new standalone story would not be connected to the animated show. So a live action series, not a movie, a live action series, and it was announced that a person named Nicole Cassell would direct the series. So it's interesting to see if if we get a live action series from that. We've obviously had the recent reboot of a couple different He-Man animated series along with that Netflix She-Ra show in 2018. So it seems like it's a good, if it's not going to be now, I, I wouldn't think it would ever happen, but I don't know how they're going to pull off the, is this going to look like Xena or Hercules from back in the 90s? I don't know. 
So we'll have to wait and see. And just a couple other tidbits here of She-Ra. Larry Dottilio was responsible for most of the series Bible and the character's name. The original idea was for Adora to be called Eve because Adam was He-Man, so you'd have Adam and Eve. But this idea was dropped because the characters were twins and not lovers. So, and the Crystal Castle was originally called the Palace of Power. Hordak's original name was going to be Reaper. Glimmer was going to be called Shimmer. Um, so there was a bunch of differences in the Bible than to what happened in the actual series. Funny that I use the word Bible there when we're talking about Adam and Eve, I guess. But So, She-Ra, Princess of Power, takes our 10.30 time slot, which means we only have room for two more shows. Our 11 o'clock time slot is going to go to the iconic Voltron, which aired 124 episodes in the 1980s, which was fourth most. Only three cartoons aired more episodes in the 80s than Voltron. It did only last from 1984 to 1985, but it packed in a lot of episodes in that time. World Events Production was the main vehicle for this. And a lot of people say this kind of helped lay the groundwork for things that would come later on, Dragon Ball and its popularity in the U.S. and Pokemon and things of that nature. I guess that's up for debate, but that's what some people say. It's interesting here because there was a team here in Los Angeles led by Ted Koppler, and they tr- they wanted to transform uh, some Japanese shows, specifically Go Lion, um, into Voltron, and they had all these different people brought in. But it was it was just some weird. The history of Voltron is very crazy because they had to do all these editing of content that wouldn't be acceptable in the U.S., such as some of the dialogue violence and things of that nature. And it was also interesting because they took from a variety of different shows, like the first season's based off of one series from Japan. From Japan, The second season seems to be based off of a completely different Japan series. I'm, there's people more knowledgeable on Voltron out there than me, but it's just a very interesting history if you start digging into it of all the different things that it's based off of. Um, you do have a classic 80s voice cast here with Neil Ross as Keith and Pidge, Michael Bell as Lanson and Sven, Lenny Weiner as Hunk and Prince Lotor, B.J. Ward as Princess Allura and Hagar, Hagar, uh, Peter Cullen as Karan and the narrator, Jack Angel as King Zarkon, Tress McNeil as Queen Merla, so just a lot of classic voice actors here. And there was three different spinoffs, or there has been three different spinoffs, main ones, uh, throughout the years on, on different cartoons here that have made the airwaves so Voltron has definitely lasted for quite a while it's got one of the most iconic shows to make the crossover from Japan to the United States and uh, I encourage anybody to dig into that history a little bit if you want to find some interesting stuff that happened back in the 80s with making trying to take some content from Japan and turn it into something for the U.S. but Voltron takes our 11 o'clock time slot that means there's only time for one other show today, and that's our 11.30 time slot, and it is going to mask. Not Jim Carrey's mask. No, this is M period, A period, S period, K period, mask. Mask Crusaders. Yeah, you know the theme song. They had 75 episodes in the 80s, which is the 17th most. Aired from 1985 to 1986. It's a Deke show, and it had toys coming out by Kenner. Head writer in season one was Terrence McDonald. He's a screenwriter and producer, best known for Battlestar Galactica. Uh, They also wrote Pound Puppies and the Legend of the Big Paw. He's also the head writer on Kid Video and Spiral Zone. So uh, the second season was kind of an auto racing weird 10 episodes that didn't really fit with the other 65 episodes. So it's going to be jarring if you're watching the complete series when you get to go from episode 65 to episode 66. It's going to completely change. Uh, when originally broadcast, Mask was the first closed caption series to air in first-run syndication. And there was a whole bunch of talk about having a live-action adaptation. Uh, there has been some rumors of F. Gary Gray being attached to direct. Um, they had some writers. The writer from Straight Outta Compton was tied to it. And uh, he also did something in The Fast and the Furious. So there's been rumors about a live-action adaptation. We'll see if that ever comes through. There's an interesting comic story where all these different series were kind of combined and it shows how they captured a transformer and reverse engineered the technology and it gave birth to the spectrum technology of mask and venom. Uh, If you're interested, go check it out. I think it's 2016 IDW um, that you can go see there. There's like action man and the micronauts and mask and all these different things crossing over. So that might be an interesting read. And I think one thing that Mask is known for, besides its crazy great theme song, is the toys. Like, obviously, a lot of 80s vehicle, you know, vehicles were aimed at selling toys as far as when it comes to cartoons. And Mask is 
obviously one of them. I think Mask is one of the examples, though, where the toys were far greater than the cartoons. Like, if you stack up Mask toys against other toys in the 80s, they're going to stand out because they had some cool features and, and there was a lot of fun as they kind of switch into different gears and whatnot. Cartoon doesn't really hold up very well. I've watched it all and, and reviewed it all on podcast form, and I would probably skip the actual cartoon, watch one episode if you want, but I wouldn't go too much further than that. But it is iconic 80s fair, so it definitely deserves its spot here in the 1130 time slot. So that does it for 1985. Let's take a quick look back at what we had. We had The Raccoons, followed by The Littles, The Wuzzles, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, Followed by a combination of Jim and She-Ra, Princess of Power, and rounded up with Voltron and Mask. So that is your 1985 Ultimate Cartoon lineup. Stay tuned for 1986, which will be one of our next videos. And as we make our way through all of the 80s, forming our Ultimate Cartoon Saturday Morning Lineups. This has been just another 80s week. You've been watching the Geek Showcase. Until next time.